Next, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Claudia Lucanetti, who uh, is a graduate, York graduate of the class of 1982. She is an internationally renowned clinician and professor and researcher at Mayo. Uh, she is a graduate not only of York, but also Northwestern University. She studied medicine at Rush Presbyterian and at Mayo Clinic. She serves as the chair of the Division of Multiple Sclerosis and Autoimmune Neurology. She has published 135 articles in magazines that include the New England Journal of Medicine. This is the chair of the National Institute of Health, Clinical Neuroimmunology and Brain Tumors Study Section. She is the first woman to hold this position. It's my honor to welcome back York graduate, Dr. Claudia Lucanetti. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm really humbled and honored to be recognized as one of the Dukes of uh, Distinction among this accomplished group of other awardees. And I'd also like to thank Valerie Stewart for nominating me. In my brief presentation, I hope to be able to share with you a little bit about myself, my times at York, my journey in medicine, research, and leadership, and close with acknowledging the many who have cared for me, inspired me, mentored me, and walked alongside me during this ongoing journey. I guess some might say I'm intense and competitive by nature, with lots of energy. Fortunately, my parents found an outlet for that energy, and I began gymnastics at a very young age, where I coached by my mentor and friend, Tom Sinan, who's here in the audience with me tonight. Tom knew how to mo motivate and inspire all of us at a young age. He created a welcoming environment where we could have fun, make friends, work hard, challenge ourselves, and make mistakes. He nurtured our athletic talents, but even more importantly, he taught us what it meant to be a team player, a good sport, and he was really a model of a good mentor. Tom is here, and he's been to all those major occasions in my life, including my high school graduation, medical school graduation, my wedding, and even my 40th birthday some years ago. <laughs> After my years with Tom, I joined the York High School gymnastics team under the leadership of Cheryl Weber and Rick Larson, and I was so pleased to see Rick here in the audience tonight. That was a surprise. It was during those years that I continued to develop skills of focus, discipline, endurance, motivation, working through pain, dealing with success and defeat, managing my time, taking risks, and a continual strive to improve myself. Many of these tools of mental toughness and training in gymnastics I found helpful throughout my career. Gymnastics taught me self-confidence, and I learned how to keep it together under pressure. To this day, I actually still visualize doing the balance beam before I give any major talk or presentation in front of many people, since nothing is quite as nerve-wracking as that, I assure you. Sports teach you to always try to do better than you did before. In sports, you get a competitive battlefield to test yourself. You also learn a really important lesson about failure. Everyone fails in life, but it is a gift if you don't give up and are willing to learn, improve, and grow because of it. Failure often serves as a defining moment, a crossroad on the journey of your life. It tests your courage, your perseverance, your commitment, and your dedication. And perhaps most importantly, it keeps you humble. You might have noticed in this picture, which is actually from my senior year in high school, I was pretty tiny. I actually started high school as a freshman at four foot six and graduated at four foot 11, not growing until I stopped the sport at age 18. So I think it might have been a surprise to Rick when he saw me tonight. <laughs> I still remember attending my first high school reunion at 10 years here at York, and the most common comment I got from people was, wow, you actually grew up. This is a picture from orchestra. You might see there, there's myself with the arrow, and John I had the privilege to be in the same orchestra with, under the leadership of Mr. Plonky. We really had an outstanding orchestra here at York, and as I heard tonight, we still do. I continued to play violin throughout my training at Northwestern, during my undergraduate years, during residency, and I even joined the Mayo Orchestra once I joined the staff. When I went to Vienna, Austria to do a fellowship in neuropathology, as part of that, I also brought my violin and had the distinct pleasure of not only learning from the world's leader of neuropathology of multiple sclerosis, Hans Lossmann, but got to play in quartets with he and his wife, he being a truly superb violist. 
Music has helped train me to appreciate the rigors of practice, dedication, and performance. Orchestra is also about coming together as a group to create something beautiful and meaningful. Each instrument is a specialist, and together they share the common goal of playing a great piece of music together, both technically and artistically, and doing it as well as possible. It's a lot like the medical team, whose central goal is to share each other's expertise for the good of the patient. This is a quote from Charles Mayo, which resonated with me. And it said, what a privilege it is to be able to teach and how comparatively few of the many who possess the knowledge to teach are able to impart it to make a permanent rather than a fleeting impression on our mind and at the same time arouse our interest. I had many great teachers at York from Mr. Ide in calculus to Ms. Ryan in French. Two really stood out for me and helped me to develop the key skills for my future. They were Mr. Belmonte and Mrs. McKinney in honors English junior and senior year. You might wonder why does a doctor really need to know much about English, but I assure you that in those classes, I was taught how to think critically, systematically, and learn how to express my thoughts coherently and concisely. <clears throat> These skills have played a major role in my ability to write research papers, to communicate my findings, to make presentations, and to write competitive grants at the highest level at the National Institute of Health. This is a quote from Will Mayo which is really the central core mission of the Mayo Clinic, and that is that the best interest of the patient is the only interest to be considered. My interest in medicine began at a young age. I started out wanting to be a teacher, and I recall setting up my chalkboard and trying to teach my parakeet to say the word hello by writing it out on my chalkboard, not really realizing that parakeets don't read. Although this was met with some initial frustration, I didn't lose my passion to teach. I soon realized I wanted to be a doctor and often joined my father who was a surgeon, an ear, nose, throat surgeon here at the Elmer's Clinic. I would follow him on rounds, never really getting to see the patient, but sensing he was doing something important and caring for people. I was drawn to that. Also, science naturally captured my attention and satisfied my innate inquisitiveness and need to answer questions. And during freshman year of college, I needed some practical exposure, and I, I early on knew what I wanted. During that first year at Northwestern, I actually wrote to three researchers at the Mayo Clinic asking if I could work in their laboratory for the summer. I actually spent the summers between ages 18 to 21 in the laboratory of Dr. Moses Rodriguez, a leading authority in multiple sclerosis research. So it's no surprise I ended up there. From that point on, I was hooked on the idea I want to be both doctor and researcher, and I was also drawn to Mayo Clinic's core mission statement that the needs of the patient come first. I wasn't sure what area of neurology I would special in until my final year of residency as a chief resident when I met a patient on Christmas Eve who would sus subsequently inspire my life's work. As a physician, some patients have had a greater personal and emotional impact than others on my life. This patient's name was Diane. She was a mother of two young children ages one and three. And from the start, I had an immediate connection to Diane and her family. She had presented with just a few days of a runny nose rapidly getting weaker on her left side, and she was also neglecting that side, which meant she essentially didn't realize it was there. In addition, she was suffering from severe headaches and pressure on her brain, and this is the MRI when she came into the hospital. And what you're seeing is a large mass-like lesion on the right side of her brain causing a lot of pressure. Over the next several weeks, we did everything to try to keep this from progressing. But sadly, within three weeks of her presentation, she died and lost her battle. Everyone thought this was going to be a brain tumor. And in fact, the autopsy revealed she died of a fulminant form of multiple sclerosis called Marburg's multiple sclerosis. And he described a very rare feature of this lethal variant of the disease that causes damage to the brain, and it's a quite destructive variant of the disease. I remember when she passed away, sitting with her husband while the nurses attended to the children in another waiting room the night that she died. I was at a loss for words, not knowing how to comfort him or how to make sense of this tragic death. That night, I remember going to my future husband's apartment, we were dating at the time, to tell him what had happened. I literally broke down, sobbing over this loss, not understanding how any kind of disease could do something so tragic. It was that very night I committed myself to studying committed my, myself and my career to studying multiple sclerosis as my life's work. After my residency, I actually did a fellowship in Vienna, Austria. And when I arrived to the Brain Research Institute there, working with Hans Lossmann, and I opened the front door of the institute on the first day, I stood face to face with a large portrait of Otto Marburg, 
the very pathologist who had described this variant that my patient had died of. It was then that I was certain I was in the right place on the right path. My entire research program focuses on the disease at the microscopic level, looking at it under a microscope, looking for the clues to unravel the mysteries that can take lives away and also disability for our patients. I became an independently funded investigator and founded the MS Lesion Project, which was the largest grant ever given to a single investigator to study multiple sclerosis by the National MS Society. And what this was was a project that brought together international researchers, neurologists, pathologists, scientists, radiologists to try to unlock the mystery of MS. And this just is a highlighting how we study tissue to really inform many different aspects of the disease. My laboratory was one of the first to also describe that multiple sclerosis behaves differently in different patients. And we published a paper that highlighted that not everyone with MS should be treated the same way and have built on this work over the years. In addition, it doesn't project so well, but I've focused much energy on another disease called neuromyelitis optica. This is a disease that can cause blindness and also these very large spinal cord lesions. It had been known at one point to be a variant of MS, but work from my laboratory in collaboration with others at Mayo revealed it was not a variant. We identified a unique biomarker, and this has permitted us to make major impact on preserving patients' lives, getting them on treatment early, and really relearning about what this disease is and how it's uh, involved in the nervous system. Finally, my laboratory also has focused on understanding MS at the tissue level, and we've been able to show that perhaps MS begins in the outer part of the brain called the cortex. This has raised new insights and has been paradigm shifting in our thinking of where the disease begins and where our therapies may need to target this. Now, leadership opportunities for women are not always easy to come by. I've had an opportunity to participate in leadership along the way, grabbing those opportunities and trying to make the most of them. There are a number of reasons, however, why sometimes this is more challenging for women. Despite increases in percentages of women medical school graduates and faculty over the past decade, women physicians and scientists are underrepresented in academic medicine's highest levels, known as a C-suite. The challenges of today and the future require novel approaches and solutions that depend on having diverse leaders. Such diversity has been widely shown to be critical to creating initiatives and solving complex problems, as it is really going to be those that we continue to face in academic medicine and science. Now, I also have another quote by Dr. Will Mayo that no one is big enough to be independent of others. Here I want to talk about teamwork. When it comes to my academic career, any success I've had, I can attribute to a team of people that have worked with me, shared in their knowledge, expertise, and resources. Dr. Vanda Lennon at the Mayo Clinic was one of my first mentors when I arrived at age 18. And I remember after that first summer, her telling me, you know, Claudia, you'll never achieve a professional career with hair like that. <laughs> she came from a generation where women were meant to hide their femininity in order to be taken seriously. Fortunately, that is changing, and as you can see, I still have the hair. <laughs> My main mentor has been Hans Lossmann, who trained me in experimental neuropathology in Wolfgang Brook in Germany. We've had a long-lasting and fruitful collaboration over the years. I've trained many students, and often having them over at Thanksgiving. They're from all countries, such as China, Italy, Romania, Russia, Saudi Arabia. It's been truly a privilege to be involved in their training. I conclude a bit with the three F's. I never got an F in high school, but the F's stand for faith, family, and friends. Much of my journey has been grounded in faith. I show this slide of astrocytes. These are cells in the brain, excuse me. And what you can appreciate here in these cells are these nuclei in blue. Surpri suffice it to say, I was a bit surprised looking down the microscope to actually find an astrocyte here with a cross in it. My work, as I told you, involves studying the microscopic aspects of MS, and I'm always perplexed and at the same time amazed by the intric intricate complexities of the cell and the elegant complexity of the nervous system, which really has deepened my appreciation for God's wisdom. The next slide shows you my high school friends, several of whom are at the table here tonight, Mary and Cheryl. And over the years, they provided me with security, stability, humor. You don't need a lot of high school friends in, uh, in high school. You just need a few good ones, the ones who are going to be by your side at the good and the bad times. I'd also like to thank my father here in the middle, who really wanted to be here tonight, but his health didn't permit it. 
he has really been the one who encouraged me to dream big, believed in me, thought I could do anything, even when I said, really, Dad, I can't. And he uh, it also inspired me to be the doctor I am today. He always put the patient first, often not even charging for their care, willing to see them whenever, adored by his staff and patients, brilliant in every sense of the word, with a memory beyond compare. And here you see my mother, who gives me unconditional love. She doesn't care if I'm the best or the worst. And that's important for parents to know. And she's willing to do anything for her family, a fighter in her own, own right, brilliant, speaking seven languages. And I remember at age 10 when she gave me a plaque which read, first engage brain before engaging mouth. I still strive to follow these important words of advice to this day. In Rochester also is living my 105-year-old grandmother. She has demonstrated dignity, perseverance, enduring two world wars, loss of her father, her sister, her brother, and knows her life is still blessed and she appreciates it. My brother up there reminds me not to fret the small stuff. It's important to know life is not about only the five and 10 year plans. While planning for the future, you might forget, forget to live about for the day. My sister Sylvia, who's here in the audience, and unfortunately that's really dark, she's challenged me to live the life to the fullest. She's always been there for me, and she re reminds me to face challenges head on without complaining. And my sister Adriana, mother nurse teacher, the true triple threat, who combines humility, empathy, and a genuine love in everything she does. And I have my mother-in-law, Rita, there. She lived in Rochester with us as well. She died two years ago of colon cancer. She really showed me how to fight with dignity and courage. And my last slide here, last two slides, is just my husband, Matt, who I met on an ultimate Frisbee field, competitive as ever in Rochester, Minnesota. Love of my life, sharing interests, values, having fun, and a team in every sense of the word. That's necessary when you've got two working parents and he's at home carting the kids around town as we speak. And finally, my daughters. They are the reason I get up in the morning and run home at the end of the day, keeping me grounded and giving me perspective. They really don't care if mommy doesn't get a grant, publish a paper. They just want their mommy, and I make it a central priority to be there for them. So yes, life is a bit busy, a bit of a balancing act. But my years at York and those before and after have taught me several important things. They are to find your passion, set your goals, aim high, practice and take risks, challenge yourself, learn from failures, don't give up, recognize others, keep learning, lead with integrity, have empathy, teach, and serve. And finally, in a closing quote, first from Charlie Mayo, that the scientist is not content to stop at the obvious, and from Michelangelo, the greater risk is not that we aim too high and fail, but that we aim too low and succeed. Thank you.